the Kyoto Protocol is really a story of delay and failure, and it's an important, still important for us to understand it in the context of the lead up to the Paris Agreement and why the Paris Agreement is the way it is. So in, we want to look at it in that context of how do we get to the situation we're in now. So this is the tenth of our lectures telling the story of the major international treaties since 1945. We looked at the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. We saw that that was a, uh, a framework convention that, as with many other treaties, leaves the details to be worked out in subsidiary protocols and later agreements. So the first of the later agreements uh, reached was the Kyoto Protocol in 1997. So let's focus on it. So in this lecture, I want to start just with unpacking some of the major themes or framing of public debate on climate change. Economic lunacy, uh, summary of global action on climate change. I might skip over that and leave it until tomorrow. Um, I'm conscious about the amount of information you guys have heard today. So let's just focus on unpacking the Kyoto Protocol for, the, for our purposes now and gaps and criticisms of it. I'll mention RED plus, reduced emissions from deforestation and land degradation. And uh, yeah, and then we'll break and we'll come back tomorrow and talk about Paris Agreement. So the context of this we've already looked at. Uh, so post-1992, uh, particularly uh, focus, there was a focus on taking action on climate change and it, it basically, was, it started in 1992 strongly and then basically stalled and then after 2001 with the terrorist attacks and the shift in the US uh, focus onto you know wars in Afghanistan and Iraq um, it's just yeah really taken the wind out of the sails of action on climate change. So the Kyoto Protocol um, occurs in that context but can I just unpack a couple of things because I um, I made a handout on this and I've put it up as a handout on the website but I didn't want to print it out for you because I thought it's, it's enough just to talk about it. Um, a few years ago I saw this interesting article by Matthew Nisbet uh, and it was about disruptive ideas and public intellectuals. And notice how, can you guys read that? On the left hand column he's got groups of, he calls them ecological activists, smart growth reformers, eco-modernists and he talked about how they, those different groups frame the problems, then their outlook on nature their outlook on technology, their policy proposals and the model of social change that they propose. I found that really interesting because, you know, you see so many, like you see someone like Greta Thunberg and then you see someone like, I don't know, um, our Prime Minister in Australia, Scott Morrison, and they have such different perspectives in so many ways. And I found this an interesting way of trying to group some of the major um, perspectives, but also looking at how they frame the problem and then technology and policy proposals and, and that they're all interrelated. So I found it really interesting. And I then proposed sort of a, a, a variation of what he had proposed. And can I just point out that he didn't agree with me. So he, um, I wrote to, um, uh, it was Matthew, yeah, Nisbet, emailed him and said, oh, I really liked your article. and it's really made me think, uh, and I, I think that you're the, I thought that the titles he chose for the groups were quite um, problematic. So he called them ecological activists, smart growth reformers, and eco-modernists. He didn't have any category for deniers or fake skeptics. Um, and I thought that the terms he used were quite pejor pejorative in that they sort of imply, like he could, who could be opposed to a smart growth reformer? And what is an eco-modernist, you know? And it sounds actually like there must be environmental and modern, that sounds good. Uh, and then ecological activists as well. It's, you know, they've all got this spin. And yet, so my split, but see how I've got groups, problem framing, outlook on nature, outlook on technology, policy proposals, and, and models for social change. And just broadly, I think it's a useful, sort of split between the urgency I've brought in there, see on the left? So there's a split between thinking there's urgent action is required and thinking urgent action is not required. So the ones above the halfway split in the sort of light pink, there's the two groups, 
new system reformers, and I've called them current system reformers. Can I just put my hand up and say I'm a current system reformer? So these people work within the current system. So I'm a lawyer. I work with the laws I've got, try and sue coal mines, uh, you know, take people to court. I'm working within the existing laws. I'm not out there, Greta Thunberg, um, protesting. Sometimes I represent climate protesters, but my view is um, I'm, my skills are basically in working within the system that's there and trying to make it, you know, as much as I can out of it. So I work within the current system, including the UNFCCC market and capitalism. And people in that sort of group are like Al Gore, Nicholas Stern, who was an economist, um, Ban Ki-moon, um, Chris... Christiana Figula is the former Secretary General, not Secretary General, the Secretary of the UNFCCC. So Ban Ki-moon was a former, um, uh, not Solicitor General, former um, UN Secretary General. Now we've got um, um, Antonio Guterres. So, so the Secretary General, you know, of the UN, for instance, you would think, well, they work within the system, they believe in the UN, they you know, want us to all work together. So we're current system reformers. We want to make the current system better. Whereas new system reformers are seeking fundamental changes in current society and social consciousness. So I'm going to say Greta Thunberg there. But people like Bill McKibben, uh, Vaclav Smil, um, Clive Hamilton, George Monbiot, they say capitalism is broken. We need to, you know, decouple. You know, we need to change the very way our society fo functions. Uh, we should basically come up with new ways of thinking, and, you know, they're basically this. They want. They aren't prepared to work within the current system. They say it's broken. It's fundamental. We need to change it. And, in many ways, I agree. But, for me, I don't see that actually that's possible. Like, I think we're stuck with capitalism and stuck with, you know, the current systems. So that's probably just my perspective as a lawyer as much. So if you want to go and, you know, you really respect Greta Thunberg and people calling for social change, it's just that I work with the tools I've got. And as a lawyer, I work, you know, I can't go into court and argue for, you know, things that aren't the law now. I have to work with the law that's there. So, yes, you got a question? You know, that is a fantastic question, and I should give you a <laughs> Thank you, um, something. I'm down to, uh, is the snake okay? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Is this is the most honest answer I can give you to that? I don't know. I, uh, it's really hard to see what the way forward is. I do think the current system is fundamentally broken, and I have serious doubts that the current system can actually um, achieve even the two degree target uh, or protect coral reefs. I, you know, the current system doesn't look like it will achieve that. Uh, at the same time, um, I don't believe in fairy, you know, in fairy tales. So if I don't think that I can change the system, then what am I going to work with? Am I just going to give up and go away and, you know, twiddle my thumbs and I feel like sometimes going away to New Zealand and becoming a hut warden and just living on $10 a week and, <laughs> and um, being very uh, close to nature. Um, but would that achieve anything? Or, you know, should I just keep banging myself against a brick wall in courts? So it would probably achieve more if I was in... Um, the depths of New Zealand, but better for my health. Um, so I can't say that you know, the current system reform is going to work. I'm highly doubtful of it. It's just that I can't see of any alternative for me that, I, you know, I'm not as... I, I thought, like, that speech that Greta Thunberg gave was amazing. Like, for a 16-year-old to have the courage that she's got, and I think she's just right. Um, and she's had such cut through at an international level. She's really amazing, uh, and I'm, you know, I'm obviously not that. 
I'm, you know, the boring lawyer that you see before you, <laughs> balding, balding, middle-aged white fella. Um, I also strongly believe that women should be, you know, promoted to, you know, in being leaders in our society. So I think that, you know, middle-aged white guys like me should be promoting women to go forward and not being, you know, I don't believe that we need more Scott Morrisons. Uh, we need, um, you know, people like Senator Penny Wong, although she can't be Prime Minister because she's a, but, you know, an Asian woman. Wouldn't that be a great Prime Minister for Australia? Or, you know, can't we just invade New Zealand and um, snazzle its Prime Minister to be ours? <laughs> so, or let's all move to New Zealand. No, I don't, I can't be the new system reformer because I don't actually think that I can achieve that. So I work with what I can. And so that, I'm just saying it puts me within, I'm working within the system. I really appreciate what people in, in the, you know, new system reformers are trying to do. I just... I don't. Um, I think it's probably a new system, in that it's really talking about rethinking about. You know, it's trying to. So our whole view of sort of you know, there's such a focus on neo neoliberalism in our thinking in the U.S. and in Australia. So neoliberalism is anti-government. Uh, anti-regulation or anti-business regulation so it's about lower taxes less regulation for business and basically about a free-for-all for market capitalism let the market work it out so that's such a fundamental way of thinking in government in the US and Australia and I think the Green New Deal is you know about pushing back against that um, yeah okay so the other Side, the techno optimists or delayers. Um, so there's a fellow called Bjorn Longborg, who was this Danish writer. Really, I found him really interesting when I was doing my PhD. He had this book called Skeptical Environmentalist. Uh, it was published in 2001, and the basic idea was that the world is getting better and better, and all of the evidence points to that, and all of these uh, environmentalists who are running around saying the world is going to end. Um, are basically driven by, quote, a Calvinistic sense of guilt. So I had to look up who Calvin was, but he was this religious guy and was very much into guilt. And it really made me think when I was in my PhD, you know, am I just, you know, am I, is he right? Am I just seeing the world, you know, through my own biases? And he wrote this, this, this interesting book, and, and I, wanted, I started to talk about it, but then I skipped over it in the workshop on good, you know, research, because... What that book taught me is one of the biggest traps in advanced research is starting with a conclusion and then fitting your evidence to, to reach the conclusion that you've already reached. And it's really hard to, to actually recognise your own biases. Like I'm sure he honestly believes his own stuff. But when you actually look at his book, it just seems so misleading in many ways. And I really think that he had a conclusion that the world is getting better and better, and then he fitted the evidence to, to reach, the, to justify that conclusion, to reaffirm what he'd already decided, and it made me think about in research about you know am I doing that, trying to unpack ideas and about critical thinking. So he would say yes. Well, in his book, he, d he doubted climate science, but he since said, well, climate science is right, but he says we don't need to take any strong action because technology will fix it. So a techno-optimist or a delayer. Yes, there's a, you know, climate change is real, but it's not going to be catastrophic and we've got plenty of time, we can fix it, humanity will solve it. So techno-optimism. And then there's the outright deniers, fake skeptics. So people that say, you know, climate change is actually bunkum, it's not real, it's made up, it's these catastrophists. Um, so, and they don't even see a problem, so obviously they don't see there's any need for a solution. So, different ways that those different streams, and obviously there's lots of people, you know, you can't divide the world into neat categories like that. Any thoughts on that, comments? Okay, well, um, I've put that up on the Blackboard site. I didn't want to give us a handout and, you know, print it. Um, it was just an idea. I found it really interesting to look at 
those sorts of streams. So someone like Greta Thunberg is a, you know, she wants fundamental change. And uh, I thought this was a really interesting perspective on her speech. The actual content of Thunberg's speeches lie well outside the bounds of conventional politics. Like many climate activists, she wants us to leave behind many things that we now take for granted. And yeah, the decisions would mean the end to the sort of way we do things now and basically aiming to just survive. And she said this, the science doesn't mainly speak of the great opportunities to create the science society we always wanted, she told um, the US Congress. Uh, it tells of unspoken human sufferings, which will get worse and worse the longer we delay action, unless we start to act now. And yes, of course, a sustainable trans transformed world will include lots of new benefits, but you have to understand this is not primarily an opportunity to create new green jobs, new businesses, or new economic growth. This is above all an emergency, and not just an emergency, this is the biggest crisis humanity has ever faced. So her primary commitment is to survival, and yeah, not more and more. So yeah, it's hard to imagine uh, any academic basically agreeing with her. So pretty well the world pats her on the head and says, wow, what a brilliant, you know, that's really, you're really brave and what a good young girl you are. Now go away and let the adults um, deal with this situation. Yeah, so Vaclav Smil um, writes about tech, techno-optimists and yeah, talks about the the need to change our economic thinking. Yes? So, with Greta Thunberg, um, just trying to understand it. So, she's saying that there's this opportunity to create a Mm. Bring on the revolution! You're, I wouldn't. I thought you would have been a, a new system. No, I didn't. Wouldn't have taken you for a new system reformer. <laughs> Well, those are my terms. I think she definitely sees a movement and, yeah, definitely building for a coalition, um, but really working with what she's got and just trying to draw people to say, this is an emergency, the, what you're currently doing is unacceptable because it's not going to actually save us and we need to think about survival. We need to be doing things that don't rely upon technologies that haven't been invented and basically pass on all of the damage to, to my generation and people that come after us. That's what she's primarily saying. Yeah, so I can't answer all of these questions. I don't know. I don't know. I, you know, I, she's not, I'm the, you know, she's just one person that's built this incredible m movement, you know, has just sort of risen up with her and like um, people at her age. You know, so all the marches we've had in Australia, it's powerful, but it's essentially been ignored right now by, you know, Scott Morrison and the like. They're talking about, you know, new laws to clamp down on activists to stop them. You know, they're calling them eco-terrorists. Uh, so, you know, the power is certainly not with the, um, with the climate activists at present. They don't hold power. So I don't know the answer. Uh, I, you know, want to think about it for the purposes of our course, but I can't give you an answer whether they're right or whether they'll succeed. Anyone else? Okay, let's move on. Yep. 
Yeah, that's, that's a good point. She's really focused on the science and saying, look, read the science. This is what it says. These are the outcomes. Uh, it's, you know, yeah. to, u- to, use it, to use an analogy, it's like our current approach is to jump off a tall building and hope that we'll invent a parachute on the way down. And what she's saying is, hey, don't jump off the building. Um, so the laws of gravity basically is she's saying the laws of gravity are that you will fall and you'll be killed and it's unlikely you'll be able to invent a parachute on the way down she's saying that that's reality but we're deciding to jump so um, yeah if you related it to simply the laws of gravity that's an analogy for it okay um, Vaclav Smell I won't dwell on him um, but yeah essentially he's an economist that's written about a fundamental departure from yeah, the established pattern of maximising growth and promoting material consumption. And yeah, very interesting writer. Um, a big fan of his is Bill Gates. So uh, yeah, int- very, very interesting writer. Uh, in this context, we also want to promote and celebrate technologies, um, but we don't shouldn't assume that it's going to solve all of our problems. So these were Nobel Prize winners for inventing um, low energy LED lights which you know, most of us have got on us now. In our, in our mobile phones use LEDs, so they're a very low form of um, energy use. So I presume that all of the lights in this room are all LEDs. So these are real success stories in, sense of, in the sense of reducing energy use that's now used globally and has been very you know, effective uh, and successful uh, and opened up lots of new opportunities. So uh, in that sense, though, I actually might just skip over the economic lunacy Um, because I just think it's nuts that we have these economic arguments that um, two degrees makes sense economically when, you know, if you don't have a Great Barrier Reef at two degrees, um, then I just think that that's nuts. Um, Choosing to continue to burn fossil fuels, knowing we'll destroy ecosystems like the GBR is like concluding on a cost-benefit basis that it's rational to amputate your arms and legs so you can keep smoking that's comparison that I think is apt in that sense I just think it's nuts that we think it's economically sensible to continue to do things that we know we will lose the Great Barrier Reef okay I don't want to do this I'll do this tomorrow summary of climate action Um, let's just look at the Kyoto Protocol so that we can go on to then talk about Um, tomorrow, the um, Paris Agreement. So just really briefly, so the UNFCCC is agreed in 1992. Sorry, it was always proposed that there would be a more detailed commitment under a later protocol. That occurred in the Kyoto Protocol, which um, was agreed in the Japanese city of Kyoto. So here's the Great Hall where they're actually meeting in Kyoto. And this isn't actually um, signing the Kyoto Agreement. This was um, Bill Clinton signing the NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. But Al Gore, who's standing there, a young version of Al Gore, was the vice president at the time. He flew in and basically Kyoto Protocol didn't look like it would get through and Al Gore managed to negotiate it or you know, drag it through. So it was very much his um, the product of his diplomacy. Uh, the Clinton government wanted to... Um, to ratify it but they took it to the US Senate and it voted 95-0 against ratifying the Kyoto Protocol so the US has never been able to ratify it or never did Um, and one senator described it as the first time in history that an American president has allowed foreign interests to control and limit the growth of the US economy so anyway Kyoto Protocol to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change so it's a subsidiary to the UNFCCC And basically, in summary, they created binding commitments for emissions reductions for Annex 1 countries during a commitment period of 2008 to 2012. And then it created three flexibility mechanisms to achieve them. So joint implementation, clean development, and emissions trading. And there's some other mechanisms, but I, yeah, other minor things. They were the three main flexibility mechanisms. There was nothing about leaving coal in the ground. It was all about um, yeah, these commitments to your emissions reductions and it was only for a period of four years. So it signed in 1997 for a commitment period for 2008 to 2012 and only 
the developed countries like Australia and the US and Canada gave commitments to reduce their emissions. There were no commitments from countries like China or other developing countries, which was one of the big criticisms of it. Why do you think they chose the period 2008 to 2012? If you're thinking in 1997, why that period? It's 10 years after, so what's 10 years? If you're thinking about knowing it, you, no one's suggesting it's going to be the full answer. Why give a set targets or commitments that are 10 years away? Yep, so they're not setting it for the next year. So it's something that they're going to do in ten, you know, reach by 10 years. So if you're a bit ambitious in your targets, it's still something you've got to work towards. You can't do it overnight. But why not make it 50 years away? It's because uh, policy is generally only big short-term. Yes. So if you made it 50 years away, you know, like governments can promise, you know, what will be achieved in 50 years, and they won't have to deliver it. So it's pretty easy if you're the prime minister of the day to say, in 2100, no child will live in poverty because you will be dead and long before then. So, you know, a 10 year target is close enough that it's actually got to be, you've got to do something, but it's not so close that it's, you know, it doesn't give you time to change. So there's this commitment period from 2008 to 2012, the three flexibility mechanisms, yeah, definitions linked to the, um, I just wanted to show you that in the, so the UNFCCC, not very long, but it gives commitment. It's got a preamble, articles linked to Annex A lists the greenhouse gases and Annex B li lists the quantified emissions limitations and the parties. So Australia had like a quantified limitation of 108%. Can I just explain what that means? So basically, Annex 1 of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, so this isn't the Kyoto Protocol, this is UNFCCC listed. So Annex 1 countries are these, including Australia, including the US, but, and, other, and basically European countries, so rich developed countries, as at 1992. So that was Annex 1. Then Article 3 of the Kyoto Protocol said the parties included in Annex 1, that is by reference to the UNFCCC, shall individually or jointly ensure that the aggregate anthropogenic carbon dioxide equivalent emissions of greenhouse gases listed in Annex A do not exceed their assigned amounts calculated pursuant to their quantified emission limitation and reduction commitment periods inscribed in Annex B and in accordance with the provisions of this article with a view to reducing their overall emissions of such gases by at least 5% below 1990 levels in the commitment period 2008 to 2012. So there's 1990 is used as the benchmark uh, to against which you can use to, re to work out whether you what is the level you'll be able to um, emit between 2008 to 2012. Why do you use 1990 as the benchmark? Thinking of this is written in 1997. Um, not specifically, but it's relatively recent. It's also prior to 1992, so prior to the UNFCCC, but relatively recent. And y y there's the assumption that you can verify what the emissions were in 1990, so you've got something that can't be changed. It's already happened, so it's a reference point, and it also allows, you know, for a large country like the US, which might be, in, you know, emitting 2,000 million tonnes or whatever, you know, five gigatons of emissions in 1990, as opposed to a small country like Australia, which is about 550 million tonnes of CO2 in terms of relative emissions. It gives you, it allows you to have commitments that on their surface look like they're the same for everyone, but vary depending on what your actual emissions were, and then gives you a reference point for that period of 2008 to 2012. So there's this commitment period from 2008 to 2012, or the first commitment period. If anyone needs to go, that's fine. I'll probably try and go for about five minutes more to just talk briefly about these. We only really need them as to understand them as a stepping stone to the later. 
So there was essentially Australia engo engaged in some really uh, ugly negotiation tactics to get written into the Kyoto Protocol, um, essentially the ability to take into account emissions from vegetation management, because Australia had really high emissions in 1990 from basically from land clearing. So by building that in, it gave Australia this get out of jail free card effectively because there'd been this real spike in 1990 in land clearing emissions. So by including that in the reference period, it meant that Australia got a free, basically Australia was a freeloader in this. And the global community agreed only because they wanted to achieve universal agreement, but Australia was a real freeloader. So, and Howard at the day, you know, basically, you know, yeah, it was playing hardball. Australia went to the 1997 climate conference in Kyoto to play hardball. Prime Minister John Howard was never enthusiastic about addressing global warming, but public sentiment meant his government had to be part of the emerging global consensus to do something. And so the Australian delegation stacked, incredibly enough, with representatives of the fossil fuel industries and led by Environment Minister Robert Hill, insisted that Australia be given special treatment. And then in the end, after an extraordinarily fraught two weeks and a deal finally hammered out, Australia demanded be allowed to increase its carbon emissions while the rest of the industrialised world cut ours. So we actually got a target of 108% of our 1990 emissions. So that's an increase on what we were emitting in 1990. And that was, and we got to include in the 1990 level our land clearing emissions, which were already really high. So we got a double good deal. Um, yeah, and we were, we were freeloaders. And yeah, the Australia clause um, was written into it. So Australia has since been able to claim that it is achieving its Kyoto targets, but that's against the background where our land clearing emissions have been largely significantly reduced by Queensland enacting vegetation clearing laws particularly, but in the background where our, essentially our emissions from electricity and fossil fuels have continued to increase, and yeah. Annex 1 included those greenhouse gases, so carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, so they're known as the um, Kyoto gases, and um, yeah, Australia got agreed to a target of 108 percent um, limitation for 2008 to 2012 and yeah basically the commitment was that that's what we would achieve. I won't deal with carbon accounting, can I just flick over to those three mechanisms? So we had, these, th we had this agreement um, where developed countries agreed to limit their emissions by certain amounts. Europe particularly was looking to reduce those. The Kyoto established three flexibility mechanisms for how you could achieve that. You could achieve it yourself if you could, but if you couldn't achieve it, you could um, essentially share technology and share reductions through joint implementation was um, between two Annex 1 countries, so two developed countries. Clean development mechanisms, the CDM, was really popular and it allowed developed countries to fund emissions reductions in non-Annex 1 countries, so developing countries, and then get claim the benefits. So if you funded a project in India or China and that reduced emissions by one megaton, then you could claim the one megaton on your books, even though the emissions reductions were achieved in China or India. So the clean development mechanism was a funding mechanism that gave money from rich countries to developing countries, and then the the accounting allowed it to um, it to show up on the books of the rich country. Does that make sense? So, and this occurred in the period where China was industri you know, rising, and a lot of countries you know, wanted, you know, a lot of companies wanted to invest in China. So it led to a lot of money being essentially directed to China and claimed as CDMs. And emissions trading um, was essentially allowing countries to trade emissions, but it was quite weak under the Kyoto Protocol. It was left to be worked out later. And only Europe and now China has a bit of an emissions trading scheme, but Europe has really tried to do it, but it's largely failed. 
Um, so the joint implementation, for the purpose of meeting its commitments under Article 3, any party included in Annex 1, so a rich country, may transfer or acquire from another such party emissions reduction units resulting from projects. So that's between two Annex 1 countries, two rich countries. Then CDM, notice that this is really different. The purpose of the clean development mechanism shall be to assist parties not included in Annex 1 in achieving sustainable development and contributing to the ultimate objective of the convention to assist parties included in Annex 1 to achieve compliance. So it's between rich countries and non-Annex 1 countries or Annex 1 and non-Annex 1 countries. And yeah, there's a large amount of, if you're interested in CDM, there's a large amount of detail on the website, just do a search for CDM. There's a lot of positive stories around it, but there's also a lot of criticism of it, effectively that there's a lot of fraud in it. There's a famous, this famous story of like dams that had already been built in. The big fight is over whether there's additionality, whether the funding actually reduces emissions over what would have occurred anyway. And you have to have additionality for it to count under CDM, and yet projects that had already been built, like dams in India that had already been built, claim CDM credits. So how could that be additional to what would have happened otherwise if they'd already been built? And there are also famous stories of companies in China creating really potent greenhouse gases, so manufacturing them, and then claiming credits for destroying them. So you manufacture, then you destroy it, and you get paid <laughs> along the way. It's just crazy. So a lot of criticisms around CDM projects and yeah, the price has collapsed since 2012. So there were to, you know, there was to be money flowing. A lot of problems around that, that's those systems and a lot of criticisms of joint implementation as well. Basically, it's really hard to police these mechanisms. It's really hard to avoid fraud. They get really technical and establishing additionality is really problematic. So it's right on five o'clock. I want to wrap up there. The key things I want you to remember for um, for the Kyoto Protocol is are these. The Kyoto Protocol was created under the UNFCCC to give more detailed commitments for particularly for developed or Annex 1 countries. The first commitment period 2008 to 2012 has passed. There has been a second Kyoto commitment period um, agreed in which ba basically rolled over the earlier commitments from the countries that had given them. So it still only dealt with Annex 1 countries. Um, the protocol created three flexibility mechanisms, joint implementation, CDM and emissions trading to help countries move forward. And there have been heavy criticisms of those and the, basically the fraud involved in them in particular. And yeah, implementing international environmental regulations at a domestic level can be very complex, difficult and require a lot of supporting administration. So for instance, to verify reports from thousands of companies and activities. So if you're going to implement, for instance, something like a carbon tax, the actual administration in that is enormous. Similarly, emissions trading, you know, we're talking about tens of thousands of companies and tens of thousands or millions of activities within massive economies to actually regulate what they're doing. Uh, and again, that, you know, the story I talked about with um, ozone, that recent um, uh, awareness that there was ozone depleting substances were being manufactured and then it being identified in China and then realizing that there was a lot of illicit activity occurring within the Chinese economy that was actually measurable on a global scale like and that's for something that you know we could actually pinpoint the source of and is quite well recognized it's so much more difficult for um, greenhouse emissions so it's really complex and really hard so there's plenty of material on the Kyoto Protocol website, but I'd mainly like you to just be aware about Kyoto Protocol, the commitment period, and the three flexibility mechanisms, that there were binding commitments from the developed countries. There weren't any binding commitments from developing countries like China. There were some big criticisms of it. And we're going to see when we look at the Paris Agreement tomorrow that the 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 parties have done away with binding commitments and they've asked for everyone to just volunteer what they'll do 
and there aren't these same sort of mechanisms in place because it just proved too hard for the global community to do them and operationalize them. So basically we're working on a voluntary basis um, which yeah, has a range of problems and issues that we'll talk about tomorrow. So thanks everyone uh, and I will look forward to seeing you in the morning. <laughs>